Sardak Songs is happy to have jazz trumpeter and all-around dynamic musician and songwriter, Jamie Breezy Branch. How are you, Jamie? Good. How you doing, man? Ah, no major complaints. No major complaints. You are a busy person. I try to be, yeah. Yep, a lot, <laughs> lots going on. I was able to catch your band at the Constellation in Chicago, and that was just a, a fantastic show. Really excellent. Cool. Thank you. I understand you just came back from uh, Europe, is it? Mm-hmm. How did that go? I just got back from Paris. Uh, it was great. Nice, nice. I know it's been difficult for musicians in the COVID world. So how have you mm-hmm. how have you been holding up where that's concerned? You know, I've been really lucky this year in that um, between July and and Thanksgiving, I went to Europe about five times. Um, so my band managed my bands managed to. Uh, surf our way through the COVID um, world and none of our shows got canceled. Nice. Um, which is kind of crazy, you know. Um, 2020, that's a different story. That was a whole, you know, for everybody. <laughs> right. Um, but um, I feel pretty lucky at the second half of 2021 and heading into 2022. You know? Good deal. It's good to see the music guys are smiling upon you. Yeah, right. <laughs> so let's talk about music. Let's talk about your trumpet, because the very first thing I noticed, yeah, I'm going to say the very first thing I noticed when I heard you play was your tone. Good God, I love your tone. (laughs) Where where, where does that come from? I mean, you know, I I think it was Jeff Parker who said to me a long time ago, he said, like, French, you know, the thing about having a good sound is that you always sound good. Right. (laughs) Uh, and so, you know, I took that to heart. Uh, he said that to me probably 20 years ago. Um, and I do a lot of long tones. Um, my original teacher was like a mariachi trumpet player. So when I was a little kid, I had a really crazy vibrato tone, right. um, which I have since shed the vibrato, but I like, I like a big open sound, you know? Um, I don't like a, I don't like a small trumpet sound. I like a big trumpet sound, so. Fair. That's what I go for. Fair enough. Mm-hmm. So we had the you had the mariachi influence. Uh, who else uh, kind of guided you along the way? Um, well, when I was really young, I, I took um, lessons with a, a, a guy named Matt Lee, who was a classical cat in Chicago, who taught um, out of Elmhurst and DePaul. And he um, he helped me a lot as far as getting my technique together um, and, you know, reading and stuff like that. Um and then, you know, going into college and stuff, I studied with John McNeil, who's a really great post bop trumpet player. Right. Um, who he his his um body's kind of fucked up. He has like a degenerative um disease. Mm-hmm. And so his trumpet playing has kind of like suffered, but his brain is fully there and his conceptions around harmony and stuff were, you know, really big influences on me. Um, he was like a weirdo, you know, he played bebop, but he's a weirdo, um, <laughs> which was, which is where I, what, what I needed to hear, you know, at that time. Um, and then also in college, I got to study with the amazing Steve Lacey. That was like, it kind of changed my world. Um, and also Joe Morris, the guitarist. And from there, man, it was the school of Chicago, you know, um, Fred Anderson, would let me into the Velvet Lounge before I was 21. He just said, don't drink. <laughs> right. um, you know, uh, Martina Roberts, Nicole Mitchell. Um, you know, I had a lot of really great uh, people to look up to. And I had a lot of really great mentors in Chicago as a young kid coming in. Mm-hmm. Excellent. So you poured all that into a funnel and you come up with a breezy branch sound. And I have <laughs> to ask, because everybody's going to ask, where does the nickname come from? Breezy, you know, it was a Facebook thing. <laughs> but when I started Facebook, I put myself down as Breezy, and then people started calling me Breezy, and I was like, well, they could call me worse things. <laughs> fair enough, fair <laughs> and enough. I have. <laughs> well, we've all been there. Uh, what, what would you say drives you as a musician? What what gets you going? Um, man, it's it's a. Uh, I would say it's my my peers, my other musicians, you know. Uh, I'm a big time, I'm an extrovert, I'm a Gemini, and uh, I love performing. 
love performing. Um, and I love being on stage with Chad Taylor, with Lester, with Jason. Um, you know, it's 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 really the music of other folks that get me hyped up more right. than my own. <laughs> fair, fair enough. What do you look for when you're looking for musicians for a band? Well, there's three criteria. <laughs> All right. Um, and it used to be that one the, the musicians had to meet one of three things, um, and now I'll, or, or music situ, musical situations um, more than musicians, I guess. So it's like I play with my friends, I play with people I respect, and I play at I play when they pay me, you know. Right. <laughs> um, so it used to be I had to meet one of those criteria, then I had to be two. Now I'm really lucky that I'm very pretty much rocking all three. You know, excellent, excellent. Um, I play with my friends, and I play. You know, I have a lot of heroes in this music, and I've got, I've gotten to play with a lot of them as well. You know. Well, there's something to be said for chemistry, especially in a band in the jazz realm. You have to have that level Absolutely. of chemistry. Absolutely. The energy on stage is almost more important than the music. You know. Makes sense. It's yeah. it's you know if it's not here, if it's not like vibing, if it's not pushing out that like the heart music you know it's kind of dead and then it's kind of boring and then it's kind of whatever you know i understand speaking of hearts let's talk about fly or die the records that drew me to you because there there's a great deal of social consciousness going through those records <laughs> i mean and i'm not complaining it's fantastic how did uh how did you arrive at those compositions I think you're speaking primarily probably about Fly or Die 2 and, and Prayer for America. Right. Um, you know, Prayer for America was the first time I really tackled uh, writing lyrics. Um, um, my mom is a social worker, and yes. she was working with a family whose daughter got separated from the mother and brothers at the border. Um, was, um, they're coming over from uh, Guatemala. And they were seeking asylum. And the mother and the two young sons were allowed to pass. And the 19-year-old daughter was held at the border. Um, and she didn't pass our, uh, uh, what do they call it, the, the test of credible fear or something. Some, some ridiculous, you know, criteria that we have. Um, and, you know, she had told me this story and I was kind of... Um, thinking about that a lot while I was writing the music for Fly or Die 2. And I had these two compositions that became one composition. You know, right. I had this like slow blues where I'm talking about, you know, domestic issues, basically like racism at home and just, you know, this capitalism on rampant. Um, and then the second half of the song really has to do with our um, relationships with our neighbors to the South. And, all of these people that are held in prisons at the border, you know? Right. Um, and, you know, I did a lot of editing and a lot of trying and trying and, and trying again to try to get the lyrics right. It's, it's, you know, it's not, it, you know, people get it twisted and think it's a Trump song or an anti-Trump song. It's not. It's an anti, you know, it's an anti-fucking fuck you asshole tune, you know? Right. Like, it has nothing to do with one dude. It's not one guy. It's, it's, it's the whole system. You know, makes sense. Um, so yeah, I understand. I understand. It's a protest, and you know, right? That's what right. it is. How much room is there for uh, improvisation when you guys perform on stage? I mean, a I lot. hear. Okay, I say I hear familiar themes, <laughs> but I don't know how much you want to deviate when you're trying to get a message across. Well, you know, there are songs. I mean, that one in particular is a song. You know, like we're gonna hit the lyrics. We're gonna hit the. Uh, sections but within that you know there's a lot of room like it's always different it's always different every night even that tune um you know it might be less different than some other ones like um 23 me for example like we play that a million different ways um very open-ended prayer for america there's like more things that we gotta hit um but i write very simple music on purpose because I am more interested in what my bandmates have to say uh, than being very specific about what they should do. If that makes sense. 
Good job. In fact, it led into my, more my next thought. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was going to ask just how much leeway you like to give the musicians in a your lot. band. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I mean, they're all badasses. They're super badasses. So it's like, you know, the conceptions that I have I are not going to be as amazing as what they can bring to the table, you know. Makes really sense. kind of putting that ego aside and like I want to hear I want to hear what they are thinking about today you know I don't want to box them in so like whatever I wrote in 2018 is what we're playing in 2022 because it's just it's not the same place and time you know that's 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 cool that's cool because I think about the two extremes in my mind someone like Frank Zappa who basically put it on the sheet and you're going to play it like this. You're going to play it correctly right. and consistently, as opposed right. to someone like Miles Davis, especially in the late 60s, who looked at his guys and said, I pay you to practice on stage. I don't want to hear what you did last night. <laughs> I never heard him say practice on stage. That's interesting. <laughs> Herbie Hancock said that. And, and, you know, when Chick Corea joined the band and he asked Miles if there was a rehearsal, and Miles just says, nah, play what you hear. <laughs> I think to myself, yeah. wow, I can't even conceive of that and i like to think i'm fairly imaginative so if someone says that to you where do, where does that send you i mean that's usually where i come from i mean that's that's the whole thing about the trumpet is you're singing in your head you know it's it's really playing playing what you hear um as much as you can and you know for me um i i I listen to what I'm I'm going to do or say or play, but I'm also like really pushing my ears outwards. So when people are saying play what you hear, it's not just what you play. It's what you it's literally what you hear. You right. Know? Right. Um, so I'm just like pushing my ears out to like, what is Lester doing? What is Chad doing? What is Jason doing? or whomever I'm playing with? You know, Makes sense. it's um. It's more about listening. And for me, it's listening. It's like 90% listening and 10% making strong decisions. You know, I'm not, I don't want to come in meek. I don't want to come in. Even if I come in quiet, there's a difference between coming in quiet and coming in hesitantly, you know? Makes sense. I always, I really want to step into the ring, you know? Okay. That makes sense. There's still a lot to discuss where the condition of America is, where social issues are concerned. Is there a fly or die sequel out there somewhere, you think? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she, she says <laughs> casually. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I understand. We're recording in April. Shit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. I'm looking forward. There you go. All right. Hey, question answered. I'm looking forward to hearing that. What, uh, what do you love most about being in music? I like that um, I get to do what I love, you know. Fair that's, enough. That's, that's the best part. I mean, I see the world. I get to play the trumpet. At this point, I've been playing the trumpet 30 years. So, you know, it's what I'm good at. <laughs> it's what I have to offer this world. And I'm just, I'm really lucky that people are finally paying me to do it, you know. It took a long time. Excellent. Um, I think a lot of people, you know, like I worked a lot of jobs at the a lot of cafes, a lot of bartending. I was a fishmonger. I sold energy. You know, like it. It takes a long time to be able to be in a place where you're making music as you're living. So, gotcha. You know, I'm just I'm grateful for all of it. When did you know? When did you know you wanted to be a professional musician? Was there an aha moment? I, I mean, I was. I I knew I wanted to start playing music as early as three. But when I was 12, I had kind of decided that that was my life. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. What's, I, uh, I have a brother that's uh, 10 years older than me, and he's a musician. And so we had a, a baby grand piano in the house when I was growing up, and he would play. So like one of my earliest memories, being real little, like three, two or three, was watching him play, and I just knew I wanted to do that, you know. I, I didn't you. know anything about anything else. I mean, I'm three years old, right? But I had an immediate connection with music. Um, and yeah, by the time I was 12, like he was in college at like University of Oregon and he was telling me about New England Conservatory. He said that was the best school in the country because it 
one trumpet player leaves, they only take one trumpet player. And if no trumpet players leave, they don't take any trumpet players. Oh, wow. And, you know, whether or not it's the best school in the country, blah, blah, blah. But, like, I got it in my head that that's where I wanted to go to school, you know. Um, and it is ended, it ended up where I went to school. And, like, um, I just knew. I, I kind of I was lucky in that I saw him doing this. And I knew that I could do it, too. You know, he went a different route. He's in education. He's a band director, but it didn't seem like a, you know, it didn't seem like a crazy idea, you know. Makes sense. Any uh, any records grab your attention when you were young? Oh, yeah. Um, lots of times. I mean, the first record I um, transcribed off of was Miles Davis' 58 Sessions okay. featuring Stella by Starlight. <laughs> And the first track I did was um, On Green Dolphin Street. A classic. Um, it was the first solo I ever learned. Um, I did a bunch of Chet Baker because it was accessible, you know. Right. Um, there's a record called She Was Too Good to Me or She Was Too Good for Me. And it's a later, it's like a 70s Chet um, with Rhodes. And there's a, tra- a, a standard called Tangerine. That's another one I learned early on. Um, and yeah, I mean, like I, she, when I the first time I heard Shape of Jazz to come, it was 1999, and that record was 40 years old at that point, and right. I thought it was brand new. I was like, oh my god, we're at Coleman's new record, <laughs> and my buddy who showed it to me was like, what are you talking about? Because at that point, like he hadn't had a record in years and years. And I was like, oh yeah, Shape of Jazz to come. It's like, dude, that came out the same year as Kind of Blue. I was like. <laughs> um, 1959 really for those. Of, yeah, say 1959 for those of you playing at home. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that That's was right. uh, that was an amazing year for jazz. Huh? Amazing year. I don't have um, to talk to jazz you know, musicians about standards all that much while you're on that realm. Are there is there enthusiasm towards that for you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have a few that I play. Sometimes I'll bust out with the band. Um, I really love Stardust. Okay, it's like my. That's like my one of my favorites. Um, I like a, I don't know if it's a standard. I play Moon River sometimes. Um, that qualifies, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, there's a lot. I don't, I don't do it all that often. But um, back in the day in Chicago, I had a band that played trio every week at a restaurant called Treat, and we did um, standards, and we also did. Thelonious monk tunes, like a lot of monk tunes, um, a couple of Mingus tunes, and then a bunch of standards. Also, those um, are ambitious. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, I have I a uh, <laughs> a running joke with friends of mine that are into jazz. I say, is it just the law that everybody has to learn autumn leaves? Is it a requirement? Yeah, well, kind of. <laughs> you want to play at a <laughs> session when when you're young, you know. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's not it's not a law, but it's definitely it's, one of the ones. It's pretty close. <laughs> what do you mean you don't know? And it's leaves, easy huh? too, you know. Yeah, right. Fair, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, your other group, Antelope,r you just released re-released your first album. Tell us a little it bit is. about that one. That was from uh, 2018. We put it out on 4 20, 2018. Um, and it came out as a cassette. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I got it. <laughs> it, came, it came, <laughs> came out as a cassette, and we had always wanted to see it come out on vinyl. Um, and you know, with the pandemic, it just uh, you know it, it gave us an opportunity to kind of revisit um, that. And so Scotty at the label was like, "Yeah, now nah, I think now's the time." <laughs> and so we got to put it out on um, melted highlighter. Vinyl. Okay. Um, when does this interview air, Cedric? That's a good question. I am. <laughs> <laughs> I will confess to all of those watching that I'm still learning the ins and outs of video editing. My my 25 nice. year career in law enforcement did absolutely nothing to help me for music journalism. <laughs> <laughs> I take it back. Ten percent of it I carried forward, but 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 most of that was from my career before that. But uh, as soon as humanly possible. So I'll put, okay, I'll, cool. I'll put it that way. Uh, what uh, what haven't you done that you want to do? I haven't been to South America. I haven't been to Africa. I haven't been to 
uh, Russia, you know, I haven't been to Japan. I mean, I haven't been to everywhere in the world yet. That's that's what I'm trying to do. Oh, I started studying the Embira uh, with Chad Taylor over um, over quarantine um, in 2020, especially um, which is if an, an Embira is a thumb piano from Zimbabwe. Right. And like I've gotten super into the music. It's not like playing a song it's really like uh communing with the ancestors and shit like that i mean it's a spiritual thing not um not like playing a song you know um and so i would really love to go to zimbabwe nice. i really love you know just to like see the music um you know or, or the ritual you know like folks will play for like six hours straight i mean it's oh, wow. like you know <laughs> You're in there. It's a different thing. It's a different thing. And and my people are from Colombia um, on my mom's side. So I've always wanted to go to Colombia. Um, I haven't made it yet, but that's on the list, you know. Okay. Um, I, said, I mean, you know, the thing about being a musician, you asked me a little bit ago, like, what's, the, what's the, your favorite part? And the music is definitely up there, but it's the relationships. Right. You know, it's, it's these relationships that we form and, the ability to go anywhere and have something to share, you know. So music's a universal language that that makes sense. That's right. More of that. <laughs> right, right. T <laughs> touring though, touring is a grind. I mean, I have friends who are musicians who've been on the road and what have you, and they talk about. I've seen a lot of great pizza places in these towns, but how, yeah. how much time do you actually? How much time do you actually have to explore where, where you're traveling? Yeah, I mean, it depends. Usually, it's a night or two. Um, this past week, I, got, I was lucky and I got to spend a week in Paris, which never happens, you know. Right. Um, I st I didn't really get to do much sightseeing stuff, but I did get to walk around a lot and see the city. Um, yeah, you don't. I mean, like touring is um, late nights and early mornings, and a lot of traveling and a lot of hurrying up to wait. Right. And then you have your like hour or ninety minutes of like prime time, you know. And then you, it's it's you know the the hardest thing for me to manage is these like um, you know the super high highs because there is a little bit of a crash that is associated with that. Right. You know? That makes sense. Um, yeah. Excellent. Well, what's for what's uh, on the agenda? What's going on down the road for you? I said I wasn't going to do this, but <laughs> Angela Antelope is going to be doing a lot of touring. We just put out this um, 2018 release, and we're about to announce a new record. You heard it here first, folks. That's right. <laughs> uh, so I'm super excited for that. I mean, Antelope is kind of my other musical half. I have other bands in between Flyer Die and Antelope, but Flyer Die is kind of like my compositional output, acoustic for the most part. Antelope, on the other hand, is heavy electronics, heavy improvisation. Um, it's a duo that's a collective, so I'm not the band leader. And okay. so all, everything about these two bands is different, you know? Excellent. Um, I am going to spring this on you because we didn't talk about okay. it before. I like to do a little segment called My Favorites Favorites, where I ask my favorite musicians who their favorite musicians are. So if you've got <laughs> three or four in your head, you know, particularly on your instrument, who sticks out in your mind? Who are your favorites? Uh, well, this Booker Little uh -huh. is probably like, you know, Booker Little, Don Cherry, Rob Mazurik, Miles Davis. I mean, you know, anything, I uh, keep going. Oh, yeah. Okay. Any, mm -hmm. Anything in particular stick out about the, about the ones you named? Well, Booker Little died when he was 23 years old. Wow. The amount of music that he was able to put out, um, I mean, like he, those Eric Dolphy Live at the Five Spot records are incredible. Um, the Max Roach Abby Lincoln records are incredible. Um, he has records under his own name as well. I mean, like if Freddie Hubbard kind of gets the crown. Right, right. Bob Crown. Right. But if Booker Little had lived, I think that would have been Booker's crown because I think he would have taken the, like first Freddie took it and really elevated it. I think Booker was going like this, just like hard left turns, you right. know. 
I don't know if it looks left or right on there, but I'm saying left turns. <laughs> um, and yeah, he had a he had a rare blood disease called uremia. Huh. And, you know, they just didn't they didn't have the technology to help him. So it's, it's a sad thing. Um, I did not know that. Woody Shaw is another favorite. You know, any particular record? Um, I like a lot of Woody Shaw. Records. There's there was this label called Thirty Two Jazz. Okay. Um, I don't know if you remember them. From like they did a lot of reissues in the nineties, and the and the CDs cost seven ninety nine. Oh, nice. Because of that, I had most of them, <laughs> um, or at least uh, I had all the Woody Shaw ones. And there's a couple records. One's called Little Red's Fantasy, uh-huh. and um, one's called Solid. And I mean, I listened to those records a lot in high school and and coming out of uh, high school. Um, his ability on the horn, as far as um, just like intervallic playing, is is really so specifically what he shot. And the way he gets around the horn is just amazing. Excellent. And since he's one of my favorites, uh, how about your favorite, Miles Davis? Oof, that's not fair. Do you want to do it by era? <laughs> yes, by all means. Because yeah, I get that. There's at least five periods you can uh, you can pick from. So, right. So, so okay, right ahead. early early records. I mean, I love Birth of the Cool. Love Birth of the Cool. Uh-huh. Um, and then let's see. It's hard to pick between like the the cooking, relaxing. You know, um, yeah, I, mean, I like cooking. Um, and then like there's the whole um, uh, live at the plug nickel box set. Like yeah, great set. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Uh, I didn't, you know, I, my friend Mark Reardon, who was in Chicago for a number of years now, he's in Los Angeles, he had the full box set, and I didn't really get it at first. I was like, man, it's like the same tunes, da 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 And then, like, something flipped, and I was like, oh, man, this is amazing. Like, that happens so often like in the, jazz for people. <laughs> you know, they, they, you don't yeah, get it, and then one I mean, day you just hear it. It's like John Coltrane was trying to find the truth their music you right. know and i think that there is there is these like you know deciphering these codes or whatever that happens um so yeah the like the plug nickel sessions and then you get into like the bitches brew and i mean i love bitches brew i love live evil um i was listening to big fun oh, that's a good record. the other yep. day that's a great record i mean like water babies i fucking love water on the corner oh yeah i mean it's hard with miles it's, it's you know, there's um, just a ton of ambition there. I mean, I, I look we at want Miles. <laughs> <laughs> another great one, you know, because I, I'm a guitar player, so I'm listening to like Mike Stern and John McLaughlin and John Schofield and all these other other cats playing, thinking to myself, well, I want to learn how to play Black Satin, you know, something, something yeah. like that. So awesome. All right, I got like, to do um, a version on the corner, like the whole record um, in Austria once. Oh, cool, uh, which was super cool. And uh, there, there was a guy there who had a uh, Martin committee from the late twenties. Mm-hmm. It's a type of trumpet, which was basically the type of horn that Miles played, and he let me play that trumpet on that gig. Oh. So that was cool. <laughs> yeah, it has to increase the level of expectation in your head. I would want to think. Yes and no, because you know it's different. You know, playing an instrument that's not your own. Right. That's got its own. You know, yeah, yeah there's and tribulations that come inherent with that. <laughs> I, I don't think casual music listeners really understand the connection between a musician and and the instrument. And their instrument. Yeah, it's it's intimate, you know. It, <laughs> that right there is trumpet Tourette's, as I call it. <laughs> <laughs> I start thinking about playing, and all of a sudden, I'm making sounds. <laughs> <laughs> I, like I was it. in line at the pharmacy, and I had my, my you know, and all of a sudden, I go. And the guy in front of me is just like, <laughs> I was like oh, I'm sorry, man. I'm a trumpet player. It's trumpet Tourette's. And you start laughing. <laughs> see, see, if I'd have been behind you, all I would have asked is, hey, what key are you in? <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, you can't come here. <laughs> I, I, I say, I sense a dog nearby. <laughs> yeah, I see you. I and I love dogs, so <laughs> there you are down there. <laughs> He's somewhere down there. Yeah, they're, 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 they just like to stroll through and remind you they're there. 
Oh, there we go. Hello. Hello. How are you? <laughs> I don't have any treats. Sorry. Otherwise, I'd get you one. <laughs> are, 32 pound Gigantic, gigantic tiny terrier. Nice, nice. I, for what it's worth, I named my German Shepherd Miles, so <laughs> it was, it, it was always there. I will let you off the hook on this and give you the floor right. for a moment of shameless self promotion. What do you want us to know about? Um, well, I already said I got a new record coming out, so that right. happens in May. Um, let's see. I'm going to be going on tour in the states in March. Excellent. Um. I don't know when this is going to air, but I'll be in Chicago, February 25th. Um, that's right around the corner. Okay. That's right around the corner at Sleeping Village. You know that spot? I do not, but I'm about to learn. Yeah, it's um, it's <laughs> West on Belmont. It's a great place, and it's um, Antelope, and we're going to be playing with a visual artist, um, Kim Alpert, who's a great video artist. So that'll okay. be a fun show. And then in March, yeah, we'll be touring from New York to Big Ears and back, and then go to we go to... Uh, Europe in April, so I'm Excellent. working on always working on updating my website. But for me, the best way to know what I'm doing is Instagram and Twitter. <laughs> okay, fair um, enough. Which you know, I know you know that. But <laughs> oh yeah, well, and it's a uh, Jamie Branch, two eyes and Jamie, no Cyclops. That's right. Mm. <laughs> I got, I got <laughs> it. And the best place to buy your music because we want you to benefit the most. Where should we go? Bandcamp. Bandcamp band is. <laughs> yeah. International Anthem has a, a, a really extensive band camp page where you can not only find my music, but everybody on the label. And um, yeah, just shout out to International Anthem. I mean, that's that's a great, great label. Music. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> the first Chicago label I was drawn to was Thrill Jockey because I was a big, I'm a big, tor I'm a big tortoise, tortoise fan, tortoise. I'm a big tortoise fan. And that <laughs> led to Chicago Underground, which led to Isotope 217 and what have you. <laughs> so, so when I saw Chad Taylor was in the band, I'm like, oh, Chad Taylor's in the band? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, in. you and me both. Uh, the first time I called Chad was 2016 in New York. Um, I was putting together a show for one of Scotty from International Anthem's other bands, the Nick Mazzarella Trio. Right. And uh, it was my first time calling Chad, and I was so nervous because <laughs> I've been listening to him since I was like 16 years old, you know, like. Chad and Rob both, Chicago Underground Duo, Axis and Alignment and Synesthesia, some of my favorite records of all time. Um, and of course, I'm a huge tortoise fan. Chad's not in that, but, right. you know, yeah, Thrill Jackie is a, definitely, I used to live a, a big influence. I used to live around the corner from them in Pilsen. Okay. Um, in the early 2000s. Nice, nice. And, you know, like I said, uh, International Anthem, they've come into my world in the last couple of years between you yeah. and Rob and uh, Junius Paul and Makaya McCraven, Jeff Parker. Yeah, just that label is amazing. I want to, I want to buy you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Angel Bata weed. I mean, yeah. It's, it's to the point where uh, sugar records has an international anthem section. And I just, I just make a beeline for that. <laughs> what's nice. up? What's going on in here? Okay. Yeah. Well, Gotta have them all. <laughs> anyway, definitely. Definitely. Well, breezy calling you breezy now. I can't thank That's you. Right. I can't thank you enough for taking the time. We really appreciate yeah, it. Yes, Cedric, man. And I'm looking I'm forward to seeing you out there. We got to do it. Excellent. Yeah, maybe. Uh, maybe I'll see you in February. That is my or master plan. February 25th. You, you talk All me right. into it. I'm there. <laughs> you take care of yourself. There you go. You too. Take care, everybody. <laughs> Much love.